Higher resolution security cameras are great for being able to retain a greater amount of detail at a greater distance, allowing you to extract important information from recordings should you ever need to. But this often comes at the cost of a narrower field of view. Reolink thinks that they can give you the best of both worlds with their new dual lens camera, but have they cut any corners and made compromises in other areas in order to build this wall-e lookalike? Full transparency, as always, Reolink did send me these units in order to check them out. Now, before we get into the main bulk of this review, let's cover the all important specs. So firstly, there are four models of the Reolink dual lens. There is a wired power over ethernet version, a powered Wi-Fi version, a battery Wi-Fi version, and finally a 4G version. The two versions that I have here are the power over ethernet and the powered Wi-Fi version, and the specs are pretty much identical on both. So as the name suggests, we have two identical four megapixel sensors, each with a 2560 by 1440 resolution. Things do differ a little bit with frame rate, so the PoE version has a max frame rate of 25 frames per second, and the Wi-Fi version is limited to 15 frames per second. And from here on in, everything else is the same between both versions. Both have a 150 degree field of view because of those two lenses. Both have infrared, both have built-in spotlights for color and night mode, and both can do local person and object detection. And finally, both have two-way audio. In terms of price, the PoE version comes in at £100, and the Wi-Fi version is £110. Installation is pretty straightforward, as is usually the case with Reolink cameras. This time you screw the metal plate into the wall with two screws, hook the camera mount over it, and put in a final screw to secure it. You then screw the mount into either the top or the bottom of the camera, depending on your situation. Plug your cables in, and that is it. Now, this is an easy install process, but I have to say that this mount is quite a downgrade compared to the mounts on previous Bullet cameras. Not only in terms of how solid the mount feels, the new one feels much less sturdy to me, but also in terms of flexibility. The old mount was so much easier to move around and had way more range of motion than the new one does. The new mount has a little bit of up and down movement, but you can't rotate it side to side at all. Now obviously it does have a wide field of view because of the dual lens, but it would still be nice to be able to rotate it to line things up perfectly. The old one you could literally rotate it to any position you wanted, so not sure why they decided to move away from this mount. Usually at this point we would talk about using the camera and some of the features, but first let's talk about why this camera even exists. Why did Reolink take two 4 megapixel lenses and slap them into one camera body? The problem with higher resolution sensors is that often it gives you much more details at a greater distance, for example for reading car number plates or for making out faces. However, this usually comes at a trade-off that the field of view gets narrower. Now, I am generalizing here, and there is much more that goes into it, but that is typically what happens. One way to fix this is by using a really wide lens, but then you get a really distorted fish eye look, which can cause problems on the outer edges of frames. So to fix this, Reolink has slapped two regular 4 megapixel lenses together, presumably with 75 degree field of view each, to create the dual lens with 150 degrees field of view, which is really nice, but with the advantage of not having that distortion or fisheye effect that you get with a really wide lens. Sounds really great, right? What's not to like? Ah, This is where my initial expectations of this product didn't actually line up with what has been delivered. See, when I first saw the dual lens months ago, my initial impressions were really solid, and I was actually pretty excited to see something a little bit different to what we have normally come to expect. But what we have here just didn't line up with what my expectations were. See, what I thought we were going to get with this was two physical lenses, but combined into one large single image that you could pan around, zoom in, do large motion areas, etc, etc, and unfortunately, that just isn't what we are getting. 
what you actually get is two separate camera feeds that are for the most part completely independent of each other. You can set them up to be side by side inside the app and the desktop client, but to me it's really not an ideal experience because the Real Link app, for example, only lets you view one or four streams at a time. So if you have both lenses side by side, and you're viewing four streams at one time, then you're only getting half the available space. And if someone is walking around in the middle of frame and you want to see what they are up to, you can only then zoom in on one lens at a time. So you'd have to keep switching back and forth between lenses to see what's going on, and it's just, just not what I was expecting, basically. Now, in fairness, if one camera sees motion and starts recording, it will automatically trigger the other lens to record regardless if motion was detected or not, so that you shouldn't miss anything. But the other frustrating thing is that you actually need to download clips from each side of the camera individually, which gets really tedious. I don't know, perhaps I'm being overly critical here and my expectations were unreasonable. In fact, let me know in the comments if you were expecting to see one large combined image or if you're totally fine with having two separate images to manage. Maybe you don't care at all, but yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'm interested to get some more perspectives on it. But that is my major problem with the Real Link dual lens. And to be fair, this is a software issue that in theory, perhaps they could fix with a software update since the hardware is pretty good, but I can only evaluate what I have in front of me as it is today. And my feeling is that this would have been a way better product if they could combine the images, that would certainly be something else. Now, having said that, let's move back into my standardized image tests. This is the exact same as what we've done in previous videos. So if you are interested in how this camera performs against some others in that same scenario, you can see that in previous videos. But for this comparison, I have put the Real Link dual lens up against the closest camera that I have, which is the Real Link RLC 810A, which is an eight megapixel camera, 4K, and is actually one of my favorite favorite cameras Real Link makes for the money. And we would definitely expect to see it outperform this camera in terms of raw performance because of that higher resolution. But let's actually see if that rings true. Oh yeah, and because the dual lens isn't a combined image like we were just talking about, that means I am having to work from a single image here. And that means that where I am standing for these tests, that does mean I am quite close to the edge of frame of the lens, and so there may be some lens distortion. I would have centered myself more in the middle of frame for one of the lenses, but unfortunately due to the limitation that I mentioned earlier with the camera mount where there is no side to side rotation, I can't. So uh, we're just gonna have to go with this. At five meters, as you would hope, no real problems for these cameras, and it's a similar story at 10 meters. Although you can see just how much sharper the RLC 810A is, especially when looking at facial details. At 15 meters is where we start to see the gap increase. The real link dual lens start to become much softer, although the plate is still readable at this distance. At 20 meters is where some of the letters become much harder to read and start to blend into each other. And you could definitely struggle to read the plates at this distance. Yet the RLC 810A is still incredibly sharp here. And also notice how much detail is lost in my face. At 25 meters, the duo becomes really unreadable at this point, and you may be able to make out one or two letters, but it is certainly a struggle. This is where I would actually call it unusable. As you can see though, the RLC 810A is still incredibly sharp here, and is actually still usable all the way up to 30 meters. And at 35 meters is where things become unreadable for the RLC 810A. But clearly the duo isn't ever going to win a straight resolution test since the entire point is its super wide field of view. So the image quality isn't bad with that in mind. And you can see that if I stitch the two images together like what I had hoped to real link were going to do, then you can see it is an insanely wide field of view when compared to the RLC 810A. Okay, the stitched image isn't perfect, but it does give you an idea of what is possible. This is such an incredible wide field of view and it really makes me wish that Real Link had combined it into one single image and there really is minimal frame distortion at the edge of frame. 
Now let's take a look at some nighttime footage from the duo. And first up, let's take a look at the spotlight performance first before we look at infrared. So as mentioned, each camera lens has its own spotlight for giving you color images at night. And this is activated by motion. I did find that for some reason it was keen to keep switching off the spotlight, even though there was still motion in the frame. But I was surprised at how much the spotlight did manage to light up the pretty massive area that we are dealing with here. But in terms of actual footage, it is kind of a sorry affair. I did have hopeful expectations here, but as you can see, it's just a blurry mess whenever there is motion. You can see that as I run across frame, just how much ghosting and trails there is, making the footage literally unusable. Not sure why that is happening, but it did seem that the frame rate was dropping down to 12 FPS. If I had to guess, it would be that in night mode, the camera uses a really slow shutter speed to compensate for the low light, resulting in the ghosting you are seeing here. But yeah, you can see from the footage that if someone is walking by across the frame, it's not really usable enough to identify a face. If we switch over to infrared mode, we get what is in my opinion a much more usable image. Ghosting is much less and movement is much easier to track. Now, we have seen Real Link plagued with issues in the past, where the auto exposure on their cameras will blow blow out the highlights on faces, making them impossible to see, but that doesn't seem to be an issue here and the faces are easily recognisable in infrared mode. Rounding out our performance tests on the Duo, let me finally play for you a clip of the microphone tests. This is a 5 metre microphone test on the Duo lens camera. This is a 10 metre microphone test on the Duo lens camera. This is a 15 metre microphone test on the Duo lens camera. All right, so what is the final verdict on the real link duo? For me personally, I love the concept of this camera and I think the camera hardware itself is really great, but either my expectations were too high or the software is lacking. Not being able to view the camera as one large image is a real shame for me. Having to manage each camera individually is a pain. Downloading clips from each side separately is a pain. And I just feel like it was kind of a missed opportunity that they had to do something really great. If you don't mind the fact that it is basically two separate cameras, then the image itself during the day is pretty good, assuming you don't need a greater resolution for seeing those really fine details. And you'll also probably want to stick to infrared mode too and not rely on the color night mode. You know what would actually make this camera perfect for me is if they replace the sensors that they have in here with the sensor and the lens from the RLC 810A, which actually has an 87 degree field of view. So two of them together could easily reach the field of view that this has. And then they stitch that image together in software to give you one giant image with high resolution and also give us the old mount back while they're at it. If Real Link could do that, that would be something else. Perhaps they'll give us that in the V2. Anyways, that is about going to do it for the Real Link Duo. Like I say, not my favorite camera that Real Link makes, but I really like that they tried to do something different and pushed the boat out to try a new concept. And you may have a situation where this is an absolutely perfect camera for you and you don't mind it being two separate images, in which case you could definitely pick up one of these and be more than happy with it. Anyways, always interested to hear your thoughts about the new duo from Real Link in the comments down below. Would you buy one of these for the super wide field of view or would you just buy two separate higher resolution cameras? Always interested to hear your thoughts. If you want to support the channel, then you can do so by becoming a patron on Patreon and your support allows me to keep on making these videos. Thank you to all my current Patreon supporters. As always, your support is very much appreciated. Make sure to drop this video a like and get subscribed and I will see you in the next video.